Well, well, thank all of you for, for coming tonight. Can you, you can hear me OK with, uh, with the mic? Wonderful. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Serpinon. I'm a director of the Honors Program and director of our new uh, Urban Entrepreneurship and Policy Institute here at the University of New Orleans. Uh, so tonight <coughs> is a discussion that I know uh, many of my colleagues and perhaps many of you thought you perhaps would never see. <laughs> uh, you know, a few months ago, I was talking with both Melissa and Rod separately about coming back to UNO. They've both been here before to give a talk on some topic of contemporary political significance. And I was sitting in the office with my colleague and, and friend Bobby DuPont back there uh, and thought out loud, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could get Melissa and Rod together on the stage, talk about the future of political discourse in this country and some of the problems that we've run into, you know, get their thoughts on, on perhaps where we've gone wrong and why, whether the current political climate is as toxic as perhaps it seems to be, uh, if so, how to fix it and, and possibly even demonstrate what constructive political discourse uh, might, might look like. So I, I reached out to Melissa and Rod, and, and no surprise, I've known them both for a while. They were both very excited to do this, and so uh, here we are. Um, before introducing our guests, who, who really don't need much of an introduction, I'd like to thank everyone who has made this event uh, possible and, and a lot of the stuff that we do here at UNO possible, which includes the University of New Orleans Student Government Association, uh, Char the Charles Koch Foundation, uh, Dennis McSevney, and the UNO Founders Club, who provided the wonderful reception downstairs for us and who's provided support for really a number of the things that I've been doing for the last seven or so years at, at UNO. Uh, and then also the American Conservative Magazine and its executive director, John Burka, who this is the second time they've helped host a wonderful event here. So we're very thankful for the partnership with us and for coming <coughs> down. It's been, been really great. Thank you. Thank you all for, for that support. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So our, our guests. Uh, Melissa Harris Perry is the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair at Wake Forest University. She's the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Center, which aims to advance justice through intersectional scholarship. Melissa is editor at large at L.com, former host of the television show Melissa Harris Perry on MSNBC, and author of the award winning books Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, and Sister C Citizen Shame, Stereotypes, and black women in America. She received her BA in English from Wake Forest University and her PhD in political science from Duke University. She also studied theology at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Before coming to Wake Forest, she served on the faculty of the University of Chicago, Princeton University, and Tulane. Rod Dreyer is the senior editor and blogger at the American Conservative Magazine and is the author of several books, including New York Times bestselling The Benedict Option. He's also written for a variety of media outlets, including the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Dallas Morning News, National Review, the South Florida Sentinel, and the Washington Times. And he's appeared on a number of other broadcasts, including NPR, ABC News, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and the BBC. Rod lives in Baton Rouge and is currently working on a book fo focusing on anti-communist dissidents in Russia and Eastern Europe. Please join me in welcoming our speakers, Rod Dreher and Melissa Harris-Berry. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. So none of you came to listen to me. Uh, you know, I've been here at, at UNO for seven years, and some of you have come out uh, for the last seven years uh, to these events. And what makes a place like UNO great is the number of diverse organizations and partners interested in working with us to host events and to provide other opportunities for our students and people in our community. So think about what we have tonight. We have the American Conservative Magazine and the Charles Koch Foundation sponsoring a discussion with Melissa Harris Parrott. P perhaps, yes. perhaps it's the case that things are not as bad as they seem. They're not as toxic as they seem. But unfortunately, every night or almost every night, I make a habit of turning on CNN for a couple of minutes and turning on, on Fox News, and they're sort of one after another. And it presents seemingly an entirely different picture of what's going on in the country. And Melissa, to start off with you, you know, both you and Rob in many ways have contributed to these ongoing public political discussions. And, and some people may call both of you sort of firebrands at, mm. at times and controversial. <laughs> uh, you know, are things as bad as they seem when it comes to our ability to talk with folks that we disagree about, uh, when it comes to important policy issues, or are we misunderstanding things? First of all. Microphone. Oh. 
because this is a different mic, gotcha. Yeah, that's the camera right, mic. Gotcha. There we go. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm actually really thrilled to be here. We've been having lots of fun email exchanges in the run up to this moment. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you because obviously we had a terrific interaction at another Coke-sponsored event at Wake Forest University where you came and, and served so, and so beautifully with a truly diverse group of panelists um, along with our, our friend and colleague Jim and, um, and, and sort of all of the, which I hope we'll actually get a chance to talk a bit about um, higher ed and the madness happening there. Um, I would say I think that it is, uh, both as bad and not nearly as bad as we expect that it seems to be. Um, th there are these new data suggesting that um, the partisan polarization that we experience has some empirical basis. So we're not just feeling as though we've pulled apart. Um, we really, in fact, seem to have. So I think about being trained as a political scientist in the late 90s, and the whole story was <coughs> parties are dead and parties in the electorate don't matter, and partisanship is declining, and whether or not someone who's a Democrat or Republican tells you less and less about how they're likely to cast their vote. Um, and then, as soon as, of course, political scientists decided that this is what was true about the world, uh, it all changed. <laughs> and so that division is not only real, but we see, and, and I think this is the data, these are the data that really make me quite sad, we don't just see the opposition party as opposition, um, Democrats believe that Republicans are enemies of the country, and Republicans believe that Dem Democrats are e enemies of the country, that we actually don't have the nation's best interest at heart, that we are actually dangerous. Um, so each side perceives the other as a danger. In that context, the issue is not disagreement. If you believe that the person you're engaging is dangerous to your nation, you're not curious about them, you're not listening to them, you're not interested in them, your only goal is to defeat. So in that sense, yes, it is as bad as we think. But do <coughs> I believe that this is the worst time in American history? Nah, I'm a black girl, I'm not nostalgic about anything <laughs> ever, except, right? except like hip hop in the 90s, that was better than this, I mean just, it just was, we can fight about that later, whatever. But there's really, I mean, so what other, I would rather live when my father was a young man in the Jim Crow South? No, I would, I would not like that. Would I prefer to live when my great-great-grandmother did and she, um, her mother had been sold on a street corner just um, to the south of her? No, of course not. Um, so this is not to say, oh, things are all better, but it is to say that it is disrespectful to those who have lived through civil wars, through world wars, through um, Holocaust, through intergenerational enslavement, to, to in this <coughs> moment say, oh man, this, oh God, oh Trump. <laughs> well, okay, so we have Trump. So that seems like we're gonna make it through that. Okay. <laughs> so, so I would say both it is as bad and not nearly as bad as we think it is. Rod, is that your, your view as well? Oh, you've got a mic too. Oh, I have a mic. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, everyone's Although it'd be fun if we could just toss it back. Where is this mic? It's, you're, <laughs> sit, this you're sitting on it. It's back ah. there. There you go. Are we there? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, there is a certain vanity, isn't there, to thinking that it's never been as bad as this. We're suffering more than we ever have because my dad grew up in the country in uh, West Feliciana Parish in the Great Depression. He was born in 1934. Uh, and I can remember as a kid him telling us that if they had meat to eat many nights, it was because he and his brother went out and shot squirrels. And he wasn't saying this uh, to complain. He was just like, things are a lot better. And we had, we had meat every night on the table. We didn't have to worry about it. We weren't rich at all. But uh, growing up in the 70s, we had meat. We also had those horrible lapels and wide ties. <laughs> like so yeah, we had, oh, other things in the we had to <laughs> suffer too. But, um, but you know, I... I think that one thing that is worse today is we have become so fragmented and so atomized, and this is part of our, what our economy does and what our media do. I mean, not only news media, but social media. Um, I, uh, I can remember, I was telling Melissa before we started, I, I used to be a columnist at the New York Post in the early 2000s, and uh, that meant that I would have to go on uh, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, they would call me on to come be on a panel to talk about whatever the issue of the day was. And I was so naive about it, I would sit down on the panel of three people 
and I would listen to what the others in, on the panel had to say and then to try to respond to them. And I would hear in my ear from the producer, don't do that, don't do that. You know, just jump in there, jump in there right now. All they wanted me to do was to repeat my talking points. And, and I finally figured out that what they were really interested in was conflict. They didn't actually want to solve anything or reach any kind of agreement or a higher truth. They just wanted us to yell at each other. And it turns out I was not very good on TV um, because I, would, I made a point of trying to listen to the other person. So I was very glad to get out of New York and not have to do TV anymore. But uh, I, we have seen this uh, a whole generation, uh, a couple generations maybe now, uh, who have been raised on media like this. Social media has just exacerbated it because we become siloed. It's not a uh, it's not uh, any sort of uh, incredible insight to say this, but to see it actually happen and to see the, on my social media feed, on my Twitter feed, to see the two different worlds that the people on the left I follow, the people on the right I follow, to see the worlds they live in and to realize they don't even realize how out of touch they are with the other. And we also seem to be at a point where to admit you might be wrong about something mm -hmm. is considered weakness and you never do that. Uh, I find that when I have gone to talk to conservative audiences, as a conservative, but as one who is not, you know, down the line, I'm, I'm not a Republican anymore. I left the Republican Party over the Iraq War. Um, but I, I have found people get really irritated with me because they want my own side, because they want me to fly the flag, mm -hmm. you know, and if there's any kind of, um, of crack there in, the, in the, the unified front, then I might be uh, the enemy. And I hate, I know the left, it can be the same way too. And um, it, I, I find that it is harder to talk about this because as you said, Melissa, we're at a place in this country now when the other side is not just wrong, they're evil. Mm -hmm. And if you don't agree with that, then if you're a politician, you're gonna get primaried. Mm -hmm. And this is something on both sides. I don't know how we, how we stop it, frankly. So it's interesting to hear you um, make that comment about a con being a conservative, talking to conservative audiences, and then um, being sort of taken to task for being s insufficiently authentic. Right. Um, because it's certainly an experience I have on the left. I think especially after having walked around with the label of MSNBC host, whatever mm -hmm. that is meant to be. Um, so you know, I've I've been a college professor for. 20 years and I hosted a weekend TV show for four <laughs> um, and, and did it while I was still a college professor. So I don't think of myself primarily as a TV person, but it is reasonably where a lot of people interacted with me. And there is this way in which the presumptions about who you are, what you believe, what you're meant to believe, and the flag that you're supposed to fly can make even, and in, in many ways I, I would say, the internal conversations and the contestation there, perhaps even more painful because the argument is now, now you're sort of beholden or you're part of this evil group and you're inauthentic and- You've sold out. And you've sold out, even if there's no money in it. You've somehow yeah. <laughs> sold out. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really true. And I, I learned myself in a, in a very painful way the, <laughs> the danger of being only talking to people like you. I, I was uh, on the New York Post staff when 9-11 happened. I was in downtown New York and watched the first tower come down with my own eyes. I was standing on the Brooklyn Bridge. It was the most traumatic experience of my life, as you might imagine. My wife thought I was dead until I turned back up at our apartment in Brooklyn with ash all over me. And uh, I was so angry after that. I mean, just incandescently filled with rage over all the people killed. As a result, I was ready to go to war. And I mm -hmm. thought we have to do this. I was ready to believe anything the government said. Mm -hmm. And it was purely out of fear and a desire for revenge. Mm -hmm. I remember listening to people who were against the war in, in the march up to the war. And I remember thinking they're either cowards or they're fools. Well, I was the fool as it turned out. And I didn't realize this until a couple of years into it. I've had to, um, it, it really hit me hard. It hit my pride hard, but it also hit me hard in, in that I lost faith in my own judgment mm -hmm. because I thought I was the only clear thinker that these people on the left and people on the right at the magazine where I now work who are against the war, I thought they're really getting in the way of what is true and virtuous and necessary. Um, so I've had to repent at length, uh, to use religious language, because uh, I only talked to people who agreed with me back then and it led me to make a really big mistake. I think it led a lot of people to do that. 
And it didn't just happen about the war. This happens on any number of issues. So it is more important than ever to listen to the other side, especially when your own side is cheerleading for whatever the policy is. But that, I, I feel like the insight you just gave us there is so important and applicable. I don't want us to go past it too quickly. Yeah. Because the insight is in, in trauma, in fear, in pain, we close, we limit, and then we make decisions that we may later regret. And so as we're watching these cycles of closing and what seem to us fairly obviously to be decisions many of us will regret later, it may also be worth us asking the question, what is the trauma that is behind it? What, what is the, and not like, oh, y'all just afraid that the blacks are gonna take over America. I mean, no one's really afraid of that, just <laughs> by the way. Like, just, I, I mean, I know that there's this whole narrative about the demographics are destiny in 24, but so anyone saying that has literally never engaged anything about South Africa, South African history, contemporary South Africa, South African policy. Demographics are not destiny, demographics are not power. People are not freaking out that, oh my God, the blacks and the browns are gonna take over America. That's, not, there may be a trauma, but it is not, it's not like a demographic future trauma that's not people are not afraid of the aliens coming and therefore this is the thing that's happening so i think there's something more valuable if we say okay so what whoa if if i see if i see folks shouting on television at this moment what what are they afraid of what are they what is the trauma there even if people are selling out it doesn't mean there's not some kind of causal thing that might be more valuable for us to understand well, the last time I was on this stage was with J.D. Vance, the author of Hillbilly hmm. Elegy. And uh, J.D., it's a, brilliant book. Uh, it, it's a it's a really good book. And J.D. has a lot to offer, a lot of insight into American politics and society. If you don't know, he was raised very poor in a very uh, uh, family broken by drug abuse in Appalachia. He was against Trump. But I can remember hearing him before I even met him. I, I remember hearing him on NPR talk about this. He said, Trump is like an opioid for very real pain, but we, and we who make fun of the people who are for, the, the poor people, the white working class who are for Trump, if we make fun of them for that, we're ignoring the very real pain that they're feeling as they've seen their jobs go away, as they've seen their life prospects go away. I think more broadly that this is something that uh, we are, we're dealing with as a country, not just white working class people, everybody. I, I can remember uh, recently, as you said, Chris, I'm working on a book now in which I'm looking at the experience of being a dissident under uh, in the Soviet Union and Soviet communism in Eastern Europe. And it turns out that um, they had a lot of, it wasn't just that the Red Army imposed communism after the war. They had a lot of people who welcomed it there because they had lived through the Great Depression. They had seen so many uh, institutions in their own countries in Eastern Europe fail during the Depression. And then the war itself was so much worse there than it was even in the West, so destructive of everything. These people had seen everything collapse in their world and they were desperate for some politicians to come in there, give them something that would connect them, give them a sense of solidarity, a sense of meaning, and a sense of purpose. So they welcome this. We've seen this too in, in, in uh, Germany after the uh, First World War with the rise of fascism. And so I think that we have to pay close attention to the ways we are being divided and the fact that people really are responding to, they're scared about something real. And we, we can't ignore that. So I want to, I want to, is it okay, Chris? Yeah. Right, yeah I want to, I want to pedal back on, on one thing here. Hmm. And that's the white working class narrative. I want to, or maybe dive into it a little bit. So, you know, again, the electoral data show us, if we just look at 2016, so the working class, if you just take a cut um, across uh, income or you take a cross, cut across wealth, um, Hillary Clinton, God bless her, um, for not running in 2020. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so in 2016, she, she wins the working class, right? So in other words, she wins the category of people who are low income and lower middle income. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's because that group is, over, uh, is disproportionately people of color, right? Um, Trump, now President Trump, but at that time candidate Trump, wins the white working class. He also wins the white middle class. He also wins the white very poor. He also wins the white wealthy. He also wins the white uber wealthy. So the Trump coalition is, is a white coalition. And the reason I think that's important 
is I think it's relevant for us to try to think about the white working class and perhaps the white uber wealthy as each having traumas and fears that are distinct. And even if we can see that it is a white coalition, it does not mean that everyone votes for Trump for the same reasons any more than the FDR coalition, as diverse as it was, was everyone voting for Roosevelt for the same reasons. But I do just want us to always be careful because we sometimes use class language to mask race. And I, I don't want us to lose that black and brown working people were still voting for the Democratic Party as they have been since really Roosevelt. Now, I'm not, it's not because I believe that a vote for Trump was itself an inherently racist act. Um, I reject that analysis wholeheartedly. But I do think representation matters. I have a lot of disagreements with President Obama, a lot, that go way back because he had been my state senator in Chicago. Like, I had disliked Obama for a long time. Um, and then also loved him for a long time, like loved and hated, all kinds of things about him. But what I can tell you is that those eight years of a black president did something powerful, that the representation itself mattered. I mean, I have a photograph of my husband drinking Hennessy in the White House. And the black people in the room know what that means. Like that was like, mm -hmm, yeah, that's look, Tennessee White House happening right now. And and honestly, I had no idea I wanted a black president. I, it's not like if you'd asked me when I was a teenager, what what is your political dream? I'd be like, oh man, to have a black president. Nope. And if I had picked one, he probably wouldn't have been Kenyan and white. He would have been, you know, from some <laughs> other kind. You know, he probably would have been from the seventh ward or from the ninth ward. So. But it mattered so much. My disagreements with that president, my anger with his policies, nonetheless made me feel American in a way that I have never felt American before. It was powerfully connecting in ways that, again, were shocking and surprising to me emotionally. And I think, although I'm not certain, that a lot of people are traumatized by how much they don't connect with President Trump. And there are others for whom President Trump is a reclamation of being represented. And for some, the first time they have felt represented by their government. He doesn't speak in a way that feels outside of context. He, he talks in ways that feel accessible. And his whiteness may be as comforting to many white folks as President Obama's blackness was valuable to me without it being a white supremacist moment, if that, if that makes sense as an argument. Well, I'll tell you, I, I feel represented by him and that he has bad hair and I have bad hair. And <laughs> it's been the first time that's happened in my, uh, seen somebody like that. Um, yeah, you know, it's so interesting to think about what happened on the right when, when Trump was elected. He would completely, as you know, scandalized the Republican yeah. establishment, but, um, I can remember very well going over to see, my, when, when Trump first announced, 2015 I guess it was, my father uh, in rural Louisiana, my father was in home hospice care, he was mm -hmm. dying and uh, he had about 10 days left and he was in a hospital bed in his bedroom at home and uh, he wanted to spend his last days on earth watching Fox and uh, so we went and got him a TV, put it at the end of his bed. and. I can remember going over with my wife to visit with him on that first day. Um, we had the TV plugged in and he turned on. He's watching Bill O'Reilly, and they cut away to a live um, to a live shot from Trump's uh, campaign rally mm -hmm. in Mobile, Alabama. And we don't have cable TV at home. Me and my wife and we said, "Oh, let's watch this," because we had lived in New York. We knew mm -hmm. Trump from from those days, yep. and we said, "This is going to be good." And so Trump comes out there, it's Mobile, Alabama, he walks out, Jeff Sessions introduces him, and Trump says, hello, Mobile. Uh, this, it feels good to be here. This feels like a Billy Graham crusade. Place goes nuts. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my wife and I are looking at each other like, hmm. And so he starts in like, with his like usual when, Trump. When did Mr. Trump go to a Billy Graham crusade? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Might have done him some good, but. Sir. <laughs> But, uh, and so Trump starts in with his usual Trump monologue all over the place. And my wife and I are tra we're very, trying to be really respectful, but we're trading glances like, can you believe a politician is saying this? My mom's sitting behind me. She said, you know, he makes sense. My dad said, he sure does. 
And that was a real moment for me. I don't say that to be disrespectful, but I thought, here we are, all of us in this room are conservatives, we're Christians, we're white, we're from the South, and we live a mile from each other, but we live on different planets. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, I, I had to constantly, uh, over the course of the campaign, had to keep telling myself that I don't see the world around me. I had more in common with my liberal friends in West Feliciana Parish than I did with my own actual conservative parents and a lot of the, the white working class people around me, which tells us something about this country. Mm -hmm. so, so can I jump in and, and ask how you think maybe we, we've gotten here? Because this, what you describe sounds in many ways not healthy. Uh, I don't know if it's social media, I don't know whether it's the television media, I don't know whether it's, it's something else. That if you, It's tough to speculate and say, put our finger on, it might be all of the above. Mm -hmm. but, but how do you think we've gotten here? And then maybe if we're looking, if we, we think that the, the situation we're in right now is, is not a healthy one, how do we work our way out of it because if we want to say look this is awful this is awful I'm I'm look I'm in bright pants I'm happy <laughs> I want to know how I get out of this well, because no, this you might a get a president who wears salmon pants one day <laughs> you, you feel represented I I might be I might be very excited for the same reasons that that you were I mean I look and, and it's a, it's interesting discussion too about about race because I remember seeing Bill Clinton get elected and black friends of mine were saying this is the closest we're gonna get to a black president oh yeah right, that B Bill Clinton was basically a black president and <laughs> No, th no, this is, he, no he, and this is in part because he was Southern. He is yeah. Southern, and, he, and he's an incredible campaigner. And so his performative capacity to sort of relative to black culture, so just by matter of example, he can sing without looking at the words all three verses of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm here to tell you, many, many progressive black folks cannot. Um, and he can, I've, I've seen him do it. He's, if he's in a black church, if he's at an event and they sing, lift every voice and sing, Bill knows it, he sings it loud, he does not look at the words and he sings all three verses. I don't, I don't know if Barack can, he probably can now, but I don't know that he could have, um, that President Obama could have initially even um, performed certain cultural tropes of blackness with the kind of um, power, ease, and comfort that, um, that President Clinton did. And it's part of what got them in big trouble in 2008 because Mrs. Clinton believed that she could, Sen Senator Clinton believed that she would be able to sort of take that residual comfort, but she, she ain't Bill. And so when she would perform it, it felt performative. And black audiences were like, yeah, that guy's actually black standing next to you. So... <laughs> Well, and it seems the country has made a, a significant difference in terms of change between when Bill Clinton was president and now our situation now, or certainly when, when President Obama was president. And, and I wonder if that's contributed to, I mean, I, I remember, you know, political discourse with Clinton, maybe it was just as contentious, maybe I simply wasn't. He was impeached. <laughs> I, like, didn't talk about impeachment, didn't think about it, didn't tweet about it. They impeached the whole president. So, He's just gangster and was like, so? <laughs> and so he stayed, and so people forgot. But no, he was totally impeached. Well, I know he was impeached. And maybe, About sex. And maybe this goes to, I, we don't need to recall. I mean, no, but I mean, <laughs> there are young people, they may not know. They were like, wait a minute, what? So remember, impeachment and then removal from office are two different things. So the House impeached, but the Senate chose not to vote to remove him from office. So um, the idea that this is like the most contentious time does feel a little crazy, given, again, that very recently we impeached a president over something that wasn't about government malfeasance per se, but rather about his dishonesty, and he was wildly dishonest. He right? lied under oath. Oh, <laughs> wildly, <laughs> wildly dishonest. Stunning, I mean, when you go back and watch the videos of him realizing he's just perjured himself as an attorney, like it's, I mean, let's be clear, wildly dishonest. And, and maybe that's a good, a good point because, right, this might be nostalgia, right? Looking back, right, we remember Bill Clinton fondly, we remember George Bush fondly, we remember whoever fondly, and so you think about what's happening during that time, it seems perhaps it was just as contentious as it is now. Well, if I can be a little philosophical for a second, this uh, it really opened my eyes to read this book, After Virtue, by Alistair McIntyre. He's, he's in his 90s now, mm -hmm. he's a political philosopher. 
He wrote a book that came out in the early 80s when he was still a Marxist. I think he's still something of a Marxist, but he converted to Catholicism. He's a Thomist Marxist. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> but uh, McIntyre talked about possible. what's happened to the West since the Enlightenment. And uh, in the Enlightenment, we, uh, Western intellectuals tried to make a, 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 put religion behind us and tried to come up with a way of, out of pure reason, a way to keep everybody together and to, to make politics work. And it worked for a while, for a long time, but gradually, especially as religion has declined in, in the West, uh, people have become, fr become fragmented more and more and more. Radical individualism and the rise of uh, consumer capitalism has just ramped this thing up, ramped this fragmentation and atomization up. So McIntyre writes in the early uh, 80s, he said, we've reached a point where we don't have a lot in common anymore, or it's hard for us to have these discussions about, uh, about politics because people have gotten to the point where they don't actually use reason, they use emotion and how they feel about something, that, that's truth to them. And it's not a left or a right thing, it is universal. And, um, and I think that since McIntyre wrote that, we've seen this go, on, go more and more and more. And that's why we're at identity politics as being American politics now, because you, you just go on these tribal, um, tribal impulses to, to, to try to stick together and reason goes right out the door. So, so, okay, so let's take that as a, um, like an empirical uh, statement relative to where we are. So you asked us, Chris, to think about how we might address it. So I, um, I was reading the piece that you sent us via email um, and thinking about this question of individualism and collectivism as you had us to really be- um, oh, th This Russian thing? The Russian piece that you Maybe we should tell them what that- Well, so it's your project okay. and, um, <laughs> well, so as I read it, the one aspect I wanted to highlight here is this, um, is the, potential evils that emerge when we fail to understand individuals as individuals, even in the context of framing the importance of groups and identities. So it's, it's been kind of interesting in this moment because we've been sitting here talking about groups and identities, everything from Democrats to Republicans to black folks to Southerners to poor people to Trump voters. But even within all of that, we are still people, right? And folks are, each of us, often quite surprising um, in our individual variations. And so trying to think about how we value individuals, allow for individual expression of um, experience and pursuit of happiness, at the same time recognizing that groups matter. So I say all that to say, I, um, I gen generally like people at least in theory, not always in practice. Um, and like the, the people are always much easier to love in theory than in practice. Um, and I, I'm interested in how individuals and groups respond to incentives. So in other words, I tend to not think that humans have gotten dumber <coughs> or more evil or more awful, but that our incentive structures have shifted. So for example, when I think about what's wrong with the American higher education system, like I wanna start with US News and World Report, I hope y'all aren't in here, but I would really like to start with that because when we have a set of rankings, what happens is universities engage in that ranking game. And so once those rankings are powerful, then that happens. We talk about media, I know a lot of people in media, I don't think they're evil or stupid or bad, sometimes a little lazy, but not evil, stupid and bad. But you know, ABC is owned by Disney. NBC is owned by Comcast. When your news is brought to you by Mickey Mouse and the cable company, it's garbage. It just, it's, gar it's garbage, it's, gar it's garbage, right? It, it is, like all of it, like Fox is garbage, sure, CNN is horror garbage. Like when you have to make a commercial that says, we are an Apple, no you're not. If you were an Apple, everyone would just know that you were an Apple, so. Th this, is the, this is the fake news commercials oh that CNN God. was running. That, that were like, real news. It's yeah. like, you are actually fake news when you have to advertise that you're not fake news. <laughs> like this is the, literally the fake, everyone eating an Apple knows what an Apple is. And you can't, conv so, but I don't think it's because the people at CNN are bad. I think they respond to incentives, and so, Part of it is, what are the set of incentives that have provided us with an interest less in, in cognition, in reason, in discourse, and more in emotion, in the pulling apart, in the tribalism, in the fight? 
Well, well, you can win political elections doing that. I mean, that's just, you know, whether you're on the left or the right, you, you strike the resonant chord. I remember back in the 80s when I was studying political science at LSU, Harper's Magazine ran a story about how political scientists or maybe political consultants were using- Oh, it's so different. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> but they were using, res political consultants, I yeah. think it was, are using research showing that the important thing is not to convince somebody with an argument, but to, quote, strike a resonant chord within them. And you do that by emotion, by demagoguery. And, it, and we, you get rewarded by being a demagogue. And, um, and I think that you know, we saw this on the Republican side in 2016. We may see that on your side in 2020, as you have so many of these candidates trying to, trying to distinguish themselves. You know, the ones who were able to hit the right emotional chords in the Democratic part primary electorate are going to be the ones that come out on top. And I kind of feel like the Democrats are going to go through, uh, the Democratic establishment is going to go through what the Republicans did under Trump. I, I want to say, though, uh, to back up a little for our Can I just say, uh-huh? Well, I, I yeah, <laughs> that's what's going to, no, for real, like 2020 is about to be absolute madness on the left. But, I, but hopefully in a way that is like cleaning a wound, like just... Get that well, out. I, I want to know more about this in a second, but let me talk about the Russian thing for a second. I said uh, to, to Chris and Melissa an, uh, an, a lecture that I, that I ran across online this week. It was in 2016 uh, by a guy named Gary Morrison, and he talks about Russian, uh, not the classic Russian novelist, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, uh, the playwright Chekhov, and others, as being um, against ideology and against the intelligentsia. Well, what does it mean to say that Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are against intelligentsia? That word, which comes out of Russian, uh, had a very specific meaning in Russian culture of the late 19th century. It meant, if you remember the intelligentsia, it meant you were uh, a radical ideologue who believed in ideology above everything. You would sell out your country, your family, your religion, oh. everything to achieve this, these utopian goals. Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Chekhov were against this sort of thing. The uh, Morrison, the lecturer, says that the, the great truth they realized is that people cannot be reduced to ideology. And, um, and they lost, Russia lost, the ideologues won in Russia, and they crushed everybody who was against their ideology. Reading that, and the reason I sent it to Chris and Melissa was because it has helped me so much to actually know people who disagree with me, but who are real people, you know, and who, who recognize that there is more to life than just being logically correct. Uh, I was telling Melissa when we first met, I, I moved back to Louisiana in 2011. I, I left here when I finished LSU, lived on the East Coast and in Dallas for most of my professional life, but moved back to St. Francisville in 2011 after my sister died. Um, I got together, my, my literary agent uh, got me together with Wendell Pierce, from New, African American from New Orleans, because Wendell wanted to write a, a book, a memoir, about how Katrina made him realize how much New Orleans meant to him and how he got a lot more involved in New Orleans life after Katrina. Um, I had done this, I even moved back down here with my family after my sister died because I realized how much Louisiana meant to me. So Wendell and I got, uh, got together for lunch in New Orleans, and I know we were both very nervous about it because you know, I'm a conservative white guy from the hills, he's a liberal black guy from New Orleans, but it turns out when we sat down over lunch, we spent three hours there talking about the experience of leaving South Louisiana and going to New York or wherever and realizing how much you loved what you left behind. And we ended up getting along so well that he asked me to help him on this book, on his memoir, The Wind and the Reeds, and I did. And I learned so much about what it was like to grow up black in Louisiana, and also especially to hear about his family, um, his grandparents in St. James Parish. They grew up, or his, his mom grew up poor in the country, just like my dad did. The difference was one was white and one was black. One was uh, 100 miles up the river and then the other one. Point is, when we actually got together and started talking, this is not some kumbaya moment. It was two people who knew well their differences, but who liked and respected each other enough to see the commonality we had as two men about the same age who both came from South Louisiana and learned to love it. And it's, uh, that has always stayed with me as, a guidepost to when I try to do political conversations with people is to realize that we do have a lot more in common than it, than it may seem. So I also, you're such an extraordinary storyteller. And so I, um, like when you tell a story like that, like I hear 
all the, I just want to stop and do all the different parts. I want to, um, so there's, there's a couple pieces I want to, again, highlight. So at the end, as you're saying, you know, we're two men of the same age who are from this place. And, mm -hmm. and so one of the um, preconditions, I suspect, for being able to have useful engagement across difference mm -hmm. is to have some level of egalitarianism mm -hmm. um, in the relationship, which is to say, it's really tough if you are trying to have a conversation about disagreement and there's a major power differential. So, you know, if I disagree with you and you're my boss, or I disagree with you and you're my liberal college professor, <laughs> or I disagree mm -hmm. with you and you're my mom, right? Um, but even, I think, more salient, if I disagree with you, and I'm a person living in poverty, and you're Congressman Ryan, and you're gonna pass poverty law, and you don't invite any person, not any person living in poverty, to actually testify before the US Congress. Now, I don't, I don't think you have to do what a person who has having an experience tells you to do, but I don't think one should make policy without having a conversation with people who are engaged in it. I don't think we should make military policy without talking to soldiers. I don't think we should make poverty policy without talking to people who have lived in the experience of poverty. So the question of like disagreement and our ability to have that engagement still tends to rest on having some sense of like, oh, well, yeah, I'm Wendell Pierce. Have you met me? Right? And like, you know, and you're the guy from the post. And so we have this, we're both smart and we're both engaged in this way that the world out there sees as successful. I think for me, one of the things I'm always trying to be sensitive to is that, for example, as a college professor, a lot of the young people in my classroom experience a power differential. Um, and this isn't just around, I mean, it, it sometimes happens around ideology, but you know, one of, my, one of my dearest mentees is a student who just like fought with me about Beyonce in class. I know that sounds crazy, but like that's, I have ideology around Beyonce. And she, <laughs> and she was like, nah, that wasn't, Beyonce's bad. And I was like, what? And we just like had a battle about Beyonce in class. But for me, a student <clears throat> who will push back and have a reason and be willing to engage that power structure is fascinating and courageous and interesting. But actually most of us in some position of power don't find the people who push back that way. We're like, oh really? And so I think if we, if we want to be open, we have to also acknowledge the times when, for us, there, so, so it's even like, the last thing I'll say on this ride is, so as a black southerner, there's never any experience I've had as a young person, as an adolescent, as, a, as an adult, where I didn't know there were a lot of people I liked who were different than me. Mm. Because I think the experience for black Southerners might be a little different than it is for white Southerners in that we're all, like, we round y'all all the time. And, you know, when I was living in North Carolina and everybody's like, oh, you know, Hillary's gonna win. I was like, no, they're not. No, it's, no, mm -mm, she gonna lose. Because here are all of my people I interact with, the kids who are dropped off at school and their parents have Trump stickers, the guy who cuts my meat, the butcher at the, um, grocery store, the folks I, you know, who go to the church on my block, none of whom want to kill me or lynch me or harm me, and none of whom have three heads, but all are planning to vote for President Trump, I mean, for candidate Trump. So yeah, that the Republicans are gonna vote for the candidate of their party. He's gonna win. Yeah. So, so what do we do? I mean, this is a really good question. Some things can't be worked out. That's you know, right. there, there's some principles that you, you, you have to decide one way or the other. I, I, I think about in, in Germany, they have a general a political idea that everybody should work together in harmony, even if you're on two different political sides. The ultimate goal is to find a way for us all to live together and to, to have a good enough situation. We seem to be more winner take all, mm -hmm. like you know, my way or the highway, whatever, whatever side. I don't think it was always that way, um, I, but now compromise is considered, as, we've, as I said earlier, you consider to be weak if you compromise. And um, I, I don't know how, you were talking about incentive mm -hmm. structures, how would you say as a political scientist that yeah. we could get back to that, we could get back to a place where people won't get primaried if they compromise? Well, earmarks helped. I mean, just in the, at the congressional level, part of how you got compromised was these big pork bills, right? So everybody hates pork, but the fact is pork was part of how things got passed because, all right, I hate the ideology of that bill, but I, I'm gonna get a damn? Okay, cool. 
Oh, so there's a project from, oh, okay. So that's, I mean, part of how majority leaders and minority whips were able to get folks on board is that every bill wasn't about ideology and policy. Some of them were just about stuff for your constituents because sometimes your constituents needed stuff. It's also, you'll see infrastructure investment went down when we stopped having earmarks, right? So earmarks are evil and bad and also not so evil and bad. Um, I suspect, you know, also around that incentive structure, there's always questions about how much transparency do we want? So we want a lot of transparency. I mean, I think we can agree. We want a lot of transparency in our government. We also, however, want the people who govern us to have some space to work out some deals. So I think about Tom Tillis, who um, is now a senator from North Carolina, quite conservative Republican, and who, like at all choices, I would like definitely support anyone running against Tom Tillis. Yeah, the most for certain, absolutely. <laughs> but let me tell you about Tom Tillis, because Tom Tillis is the man who led the Congressional Black Caucus, or the, the Black Caucus of the North Carolina General Assembly to get reparations for individuals who in the state of North Carolina into the 1980s were being involuntarily sterilized. And so for, for Tillis, there was a moral authority around the question of involuntary sterilization. And when he discovered that it was still, well, it wasn't so much he discovered, what it was brought to him was a political question about how many people with intellectual and mental disability and, and just poor people had been involuntarily sterilized by the state of North Carolina, he understood that that was wrong. And so he worked with this very liberal caucus to get meaningful reparation checks for the, again, largely folks who had been institutionalized for um, either mental or psychological intellectual deficits across the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now look, I, do I want Tom Tillis to primary? Oh yeah, I mean not primary actually, no, because no. But I'd like him to be beat by a Democrat, but in the meantime, would I want that Tom Tillis would feel like if I did this, I will not be authentically enough Republican to win? Now thank God his moral compass was so powerful. And he didn't just do it and then sling off into the night. He comes back, he checks and makes sure that it keeps, like he's a, it's really quite an extraordinary leader on it. And so to me, there is some power in that, in part because he's in a red state where it's pretty unlikely he's gonna lose to a Democrat. So he has, and he's been quite to the right on many, many other things, and it gave him some room to do work that I profoundly value. So, so that says something important about our institutions, right? So the political institutions can serve a certain function in terms of either uniting or dividing us. The media, is, uh, for lack of a better word, an institution can also serve the same function. Melissa, you had mentioned briefly at the beginning wanting to talk about education. So we're at mm -hmm. a university. <laughs> what role do you think a university can serve? Because you look at, at the discussion tonight, and, and part of me likes to think that we're, we're doing a service. My hope is that the audience is, is sort of split between people on the left and people on the right, uh, that, that we can see the, a, a university as a place where these discussions can take place. But, but what do you think about the role of the university? And you look, you look pained. Like it, it, it's, it's a painful time to ask me about the university. I mean, first of all, this news this week, wow. Oh, yeah. I mean. So this, this is being recorded right now, but it's, it's, the, it's the week of the, sca the scandal, right? So if you don't know the date, right, this is the. This is the week of the, of admissions the higher yeah. admissions scandal which is both like a scandal and also just business as usual, but on some other level. And that's right, they were bribing third parties and not the admissions office of these places. That's right, they were, yeah. they were bribing the, the coaches or the whomever, it, but it also just tells you how the admissions process works in a lot of ways. And there's already a bribery of the admissions process through the measures that we use. So um, one of my favorite uh, graphs to show is that the SAT tracks um, only uh, vaguely with high school grades. I mean, it's got some positive correlation, um, but, but not, it's not a tight correlation. It has almost no correlation, SAT scores, with college grades, so it's not very at all predictive of how you'll do in college, but it tracks almost one for one with parental income. So the SAT score is really just a measure of parental income. So it's a bad test, it's just, it's a bad test that mostly it, Enriches. But it didn't work for these these kids, these dopes who parents had to <laughs> had a bribe to get their. their well, we don't their, even know. Some of them they were like bribing it before they even took that. So they, they, they just didn't believe their kids. And this is, I think, this is also part of it. Like, what do you even think of education? It like, what is a Yale degree versus a UNO degree? What is it you think that's doing? Especially if you're already wealthy. Like, 
what kind of weird status performance is that? Well, that was the incredible thing about this, is that so many of these people, their kids were connected, they were in, you know, but they just had to cover their bases. And uh, I, to and me, the most- children's lives. Let the babies fail. The most extraordinary, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. I mean, just go fall down a little bit. You'll be, look, look stop clapping, husband, sitting next to my <laughs> teenage daughter. That's that, horrifying. That is a, the most striking thing. Everybody got, all, all the press went to the actresses whose ki uh, kids yeah. were caught up in this. But uh, to me, the most extraordinary one was that guy, is it, uh, Bill McGlashan. He's mm -hmm. the wealthy Silicon Valley uh, investor who partnered with Bono to take uh, capitalism and invest it in socially, re invest these uh, funds in socially responsible ways. This guy, this big do-gooder who was at, at Davos with Bono talking about how responsible capitalism, he was gaming the system too. And did you notice that he was caught on, on they recorded him, he didn't want his son to know what he had done yeah. for him. Yep. Can you imagine the conversations, that, how much that must have hurt the kid? Yeah. But um, I, I guess the, the, the reason that shocked me so much was even those who claim to be doing good are in the end gaming the system. So, and in fact, maybe not even in the end, but like in the middle, in the beginning, in yeah. the whole like, <laughs> what is that performance of doing good? So I think that's, you know, I think you've, you've tapped into part of what feels painful to me, which is to say, um, so Chris, I think there's a lot that we could do. I think, I think universities in, so I, I really, it's, it, you know, so this is, this is like God dying in terms of like, like what you believe when you go to your first year of seminary and they just wreck your faith and you have to rebuild it. And that's been my 20 years <coughs> in the academy. I really believe in higher ed. It's kind of pathetic. Like I believe we will save the world one syllabus at a time. I just <coughs> have a real like let's, I'm really, I'm really Miss Frizzle. Like I wanna just get on the bus <laughs> with some kids and go learn some things. Um, so I'm always, <coughs> just so emotional when it turns out it's a business or when it is um, when it is not that. And so my father is first generation and my mother is first generation. Very, very different backgrounds. Um, my mother is a white woman whose um, family are Latter-day Saints who push handcarts across the American West and her her father like <laughs> drove a Wonder Bread truck. I say, he's so white he drove a Wonder Bread truck. That's how white <laughs> my white people are, <laughs> right? <laughs> you see, this is what and, um, <laughs> And like neither he, neither my grandfather nor grandmother had a college education and put five kids through college and none of, and they didn't have student loans so like that's that that's that American story that doesn't exist anymore that people are like well wait a minute could you just be a working class person who can give your kids better my dad grew up in, is African American grew up in the Jim Crow South my his mother was a domestic worker and my father and his twin brother are first generation and not just um, undergraduates but both got their PhDs and went on to have very um, distinguished careers in the academy. So I grew up on a college campus. And the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, by the way. Um, but I love, I believe in it. I believe in discourse. I believe in research for research's sake. I believe in um, no safe spaces because your brain should melt. You should be, you should leave college a little traumatized intellectually because you, you engage so many ideas that you never thought about. Um, you should have had to like have all these different languages wash over you that you just were failing at, but you just had to engage them anyway. You should have to go be in a lab that you're not very good at or one that you're brilliant with. You should read all of these different kinds of books. That's not happening But anymore. it's not, I know, and it was. <laughs> and there was a time when it was set aside for that and the food was really bad, and the dorms were really crappy, and the pay was awful, and there weren't superstar professors. And you know, like you had the little patches on your, on your arms, but like really, you spent a ton of time with young people. And so I guess what I would say is if we could shift the incentives in higher ed, take some of the money out of higher ed, go ahead and just have worse food and live in bad dorms and make it a little less business, and if we could force liberals on campus to encounter themselves a little bit because many white liberal professors and administrators are silencing of all kinds of diversity and disagreement in order to, I think, preserve 
a vision of a university where there is no contestation, rather than going ahead and letting the contestation allow us to get better. Well, I'm really glad to hear you say that because it, this, the therapeutic university, it, or education as therapy, drives me nuts. The thing I loved about my education in the 80s was to go there and to be challenged and so to be amazing. forced to think about things I never had to think about. Um, it was a time of growth, moral growth, intellectual growth, spiritual growth. I loved it. I want my kids to have the same thing. But now, of course, I don't need to go into detail here, we see these kids going to universities and not wanting to be challenged at all. They want to be coddled. Jonathan Haidt's the coddled, coddling of the, uh, of the American mind. And uh, I, went, I took my kid, Matthew, my oldest, he's an I LSU. I don't think it's the kids, by the way, I think it's the parents. I think too. I think the and parents want the kids to be coddled. Because I don't think it's everywhere. Because I taught with Melissa at, at you know, a very expensive private school across town. And my experience at the University of New Orleans with our students yep. have been very, very yep. different. That it's, it's a two, you know, tiers. That maybe we have even students, three tiers. Maybe three mm -hmm. tiers in terms of students who are coming here, mm -hmm. right, at the University of New Orleans, they're coming to work. Yep. Yeah. A lot of them are working. A lot of them have been yep. living, you know, lives in the real world. They're, 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 not, they're not asking for handouts. Yep. You know, and I think, there, that, I think there's a, there's a, a difference yep. there between, between what we see at, at yep. universities and what some universities are aiming to do. And I understand you, Melissa, and, and I'll, sorry, I'll let you jump back in. I just had to get that in. No, I appreciate that. There, there's some universities that I think are still set up for education. Yes. And some are set up as an adult summer camp and, and just all year round, right? And yes. Because you've got a lazy river and whatever else. But, yeah, but well, they have one at LSU now. When I took my, my freshman there, um, to, I, I went to LSU, graduated in 89. I could not believe all the stuff they have. I said, you see that room? I was in that room without air conditioning. But, you know? it, but that is, when I, so I'm, when I say U.S. News and World Report, I really mean it. So, so when you look at those rankings, I think that parents and students and who are outside the system presume that those rankings are built primarily on um, research on quality of faculty, on, but they are literally built on the size of your athletic dorm, how big your your rooms are. The, like so, you can jump up in the ratings year to year by investment in infrastructure that is primarily about comfort. And when wealthy parents who are going, so there's a term of art that admissions persons use. I have not seen it yet, but it's surely going to come out any day now because it is a, it is a relative term of art that's used in all private wealthy admissions. And it is TPU, tuition paying units. So there, there's a student body and then there's set asides for TPUs. And so the campus is primarily not for students, it's for TPUs. So when parents are walking across campus with their young person preparing to pay 60,000, 70,000, 80,000 a year, they don't want an unair conditioned dorm frizzle in the corner with like, you know, a book and reading by a candlelight. They actually want a wellness center with, you know, three spinning rooms and and I actually don't know that it is the young people having a junior in high school who's looking at colleges. Don't get me wrong, she likes a nice looking college. She's like, oh yeah, this Redwood Forest here, that's hot. But um, <laughs> we, were, we were just at Santa Cruz. She was like, oh, this is in a Redwood Forest. But the questions she asks are actually never, we've never seen a dorm room. She's actually asking about um, classes and opportunities <coughs> and um, all, of, all of those kinds of things. And it's not because she's so especially different from other teenagers, she's just like, I think that I think it's not that they want to be coddled. I think we want to coddle them. But you know, this and this brings us back to the general com uh, topic of conversation tonight: political discourse and difference. Um, could it be that this is where it starts, where the inability to talk across uh, uh, across difference starts in college with people under uh, with, with uh, students and their parents and administrators who um, re are responding as consumers? You know, the, the, they want to give the, the, the student sees himself as a consumer and they got to make the, uh, make the, the store, the, the yeah. provide a good consumer experience for me. And that experience has to be pleasant. I don't want to be challenged on anything. And if, if, if I feel uncomfortable here because of what somebody's saying in the quad or in class, then you, you better change that for me or I'm, we're going to occupy the, the president's office and hold our breath until we turn blue. 
So I am all for occupying president's offices. I think we should. <laughs> but, but here's always my test of, um, of any movement. Um, are, you, are you the primary beneficiary? So when I think about the inequities on college campuses, oh, whoo, do they exist. Um, but they're, some of them are about students, but mostly they're not. Universities are lots of things. Universities are employers. Universities are land users. You know, there's a lot of social justice questions, but I think students occupying usually aren't talking about them. Sometimes they are. So Tulane had a massive movement about the food service workers. Mm -hmm. Listen, I respect it, whether, whether I agree with it or not, right? And I, I do, by the way, agree with that one. It was against Tedesco. But whether or not you agree with it, they weren't, they weren't sitting in about themselves. They were sitting in, they were pushing about labor practices, and not just on behalf of, but in conjunction with other folks. If your movement is only going to make your life better, it might not be a movement. It, it might be just like, a, like in therapy. On the other hand, they're 18. I was so dumb at 20. I mean, good <laughs> God, thank God there were no iPhones. My Lord, I actually gave a spoken word when I was 19 in which I might have threatened the dean's life. And it was over <laughs> a sorority fight. Like, it wasn't deep. It wasn't some kind of, like, social justice. Like, he had suspended my sorority. And I was like, die, dean. I mean, I <laughs> right. <laughs> Clearly insane. Because I was 19. I don't, I don't want to hold my young, I want to hold them responsible for rape. I want to hold them responsible for property damage. I want to hold them responsible for not trying. But really being like dumb and 19 and maybe even a little drunk, I want you to just recover from that. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't know anything about drinking in college. I went to LSU. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, you, I think this is another, another problem in our culture generally about, about discourse. We don't have mercy for each other anymore. I, I, I'm the same way. I think about what an idiot I was in college <laughs> and how full of myself, you know? And um, every, anybody who has any self-awareness or humility recognizes that about him or herself at some point. And um, I, 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 I thank God that we didn't, as you say, that we didn't have social media then um, because that's gonna be around forever. But um, we need to have mercy on people yes. and, and say that, uh, give them the chance to have been wrong, to have really screwed up and to have a second chance. That quality of mercy and forgiveness is I think necessary for a functioning democracy. Mm -hmm. And we are really losing that. That's how the, the, you see, that's what's so unforgiving. I know people who are, I was having lunch today with a friend of mine who is, uh, about to finish his PhD, and he doesn't want to go into academia at all mm. uh, for a lot of different reasons, but part of it, he said, it's just not worth it anymore. It's become such a battleground over things that have nothing to do with scholarship. Yeah, that's right. So what I love about this is it goes back to Chris's question, well, how can colleges, what can we do? And so part of it is the piece where colleges are more than students and teachers. We are institutions and communities, so you host this for the community broadly. Um, but I think the other pieces really are, I mean, when you talk about mercy, what is being a teacher or a parent, right? Other than providing space to learn and to fail and then to grow. And if you're, if as a teacher, as an administrator, as a institution, you are not providing, like students should have the right to fail. And I don't just mean fail a, a class, but actually we ought to like maybe tamp down on how important grades are in some areas. So for example, I think we shouldn't grade foreign language classes unless you're a foreign language major. So I think if you're majoring in Spanish, you should get grades. But I think if you're trying to go learn Spanish or learn Mandarin or learn Arabic, we actually should grade you pass fail. Why? Because we know language acquisition after about 10 years old is extremely difficult. And so we know that because they want to go to law school later or business school later, they just won't take language. So we actually make people less likely to go and try. I think the same thing probably for the hard sciences. So maybe the intro class, but after that, you ought to just be pass fail. Because like maybe you did want to learn a little bit more about physics, but not that. Like what if we actually made it so that you could test and try? And so what we do, or what I did at Wake was this amazing program in 2016 called Wake the Vote. 30 young people, half of them Democrats, half of them Republicans. We went to Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, North Carolina. We went to the Cleveland RNC. We went to the um, 
Democratic uh, National Convention in Philadelphia, and then we spent the entire fall running, because we were in, sh in North Carolina in a swing state, 35 straight days um, in the run-up to the election, and then what I like to call the only um, bipartisan election night party in 2016, um, 800 people in our community um, and Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, it was the hardest, most powerful, most important um, thing I've ever had the privilege to be a part of, and I wasn't the teacher, I just facilitated it in the sense that the students were the teachers, and they were so brave, and in the primaries in Iowa, New Hampshire, North and South Carolina, we would assign them randomly to work. So they'd show up and we'd say, all right, you're, you're with Bernie, you're with Trump, uh, you're with Cruz, and sometimes they were Democrats, sometimes they were Republicans, sometimes they were Democrats working for the other Democrat, which was like painful for the Bernieites to work for Hillary. Um, my, two of my most um, brilliant conservative students, when we got to New Hampshire, got assigned to Hillary's campaign, and we're so good that by the end of the night, <laughs> they were in a room with Uma, who clocked them immediately, were like, uh, no, not them, out they go. Um, my daughter, who's back there, who does trend to the right of me, but not this far right, worked for Ted Cruz in New Hampshire <laughs> um, a few years back. And then in the summer, they worked for who they wanted. Um, nobody switched parties, but my God, they made phone calls. They worked, they stood alongside, they knocked doors, and it was an extremely painful experience at times. Um, we had wealthy students and poor students, we had gay students and straight students, white, black, Latino, Asian, um, in a very, very painful election. But my God, they talked to each other, and I've never been prouder of anything. I just, it's really the thing I'm most proud of in 20 years of teaching. You know, isn't that, what do you think about the, uh, what's going on at Harvard Law right now when so many of the students are angry at the uh, associate dean or something for representing, is it Harvey Weinstein? Mm -hmm. Because they're like, how can you possibly represent as a lawyer this, this uh, rapist, yeah. accused rapist and so on? And it, it is incredible to me that we have it's to- It's the law, there's one, uh, there's yeah. a lawyer on each side. <laughs> we had to educate Harvard Law students on the right to representation, to have somebody, even if you're a bad guy, make a good case for you. I think the fact that our, the most elite law students in the country don't even understand that is a really worrying uh, So walk thing. back to the trauma, walk all the way back to our question. So what, what trauma are they experiencing? And I don't know, but, but, but if, we could, if we can walk all the way back and ask, man, so they are, you know, I mean, this, the story I just read was at the University of Chicago, Jeff Stone, who had been my provost when I was there, um, apparently used to, when talking about a case, he would use the N-word and he would say it because that was the whole point of the case, was a fighting words case. And this, and students like flipped out so he's not gonna do it anymore. And the idea of Jeff Stone not just saying whatever Jeff Stone wants is a very surprising lifetime development for me. And I think wrong. Um, but my husband, who is an attorney, and I had a long conversation about it in the car, and I was like, don't you think that's wrong? He was like, well, I don't know. If you say the N-word and you're the professor, what does that do for the students? And so we, interestingly enough, because my husband's an attorney, we had a Socratic method conversation. I am much less interested in where they end up, pro wants to, than, than that they be curious, than that they engage. I don't want to convince anybody to believe like me. I don't even always know what I believe. But man, I just want us to be so curious about each other. So I want to ask, what are, the, what are those kids thinking? What are those young people doing? What do they think the law is? Do, do you think, uh, Melissa, that um, this is, we're talking about trauma mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and the, the, the consumerization of yeah. college and things like that. Um, do, you, do you think that it is, um, it is possible, oh, I completely lost my thought here. Um, I, I, I want to see my, stu my kids be traumatized in college by what they don't know because that's how they learn. And I think that this fragilization of these kids, if we worry too much about their trauma, right. then we err because you said they should yeah. have the right to fail. Yeah. Uh, I think and that- And it's painful when you like really fail, not just sort of fail. Oh yeah, I, I failed. I went to a boarding school in Louisiana, the Louisiana school, and, and I had made A's in my, my home school my home school in West Feliciana made A's in math. I get up there and I'm around all these math geniuses. I shut down because I couldn't do it and I failed. Mm -hmm. And it was the most humiliating thing that had happened to me until that point in my life. But um, it was good for me. 
because I, I was so arrogant, needed to be knocked off my stool. I, I guess that uh, I, I think that in terms of our common life, that if we are so worried about feelings instead of thoughts, that's where I think we, we get into trouble. Um, I, that I can remember, and this, this goes back to the way college is structured, I went through LSU, I had like the Chinese menu approach, like you could take this number of electives, blah, blah, blah. We weren't told to take anything. The school was a, uh, weren't, weren't told to take these particular courses. The school didn't seem to care that much about whether we had a core. You know, it was all about choose what you want. I really regret now that I never had to study the Greeks. Mm -hmm. I had studied the Odyssey for the first time a few years ago when my 12-year-old started reading it in this classical Christian school he goes to in Baton Rouge. And it shouldn't be that way. I, I wish that, uh, that we had some way to, to settle on a core, an authoritative core, that we, everybody who's a citizen of the United States, you need to be conversant with this core of ideas that made us who we are, a, instead of rushing off to whether you do it on a consumer model or whether you want so badly to be representative of every small group that, uh, that you just, you only get a little bit of everything instead of a core of, the, uh, of things that we ought to share. See, you also believe that a syllabus will save the world. <laughs> well, well, syllabus <laughs> saved me, yeah. you know? And, oh, uh, me too. Well, and, and this gets back to our discussion of, of political discourse too, because what I hear coming from both of you when it comes to education or political discourse is that it's important to not be surrounded by people or ideas that are just like our own, but be confronted by ideas that, that are foreign, whether it's other individuals we disagree with or other subjects we disagree with. I mean, we can talk about, about GPAs and whatever else, but there's nothing that's worse for college students mm -hmm. if you actually want to protect your GPA than the desire to learn. Oh, yeah. Because you have to take classes that, that are, that are going to confront yeah, you with exactly. ideas and challenges that you've not experienced. And I hear the same thing about political life, too, that if we set up our Twitter feed or our Facebook feed in such a way that we're only surrounded by the things that we're comfortable with, it's the same thing as going to a university and only surrounding yourself with classes that you're also very comfortable taking. At the end of the day, you might get a good GPA, but have you really done anything? Uh, or you put yourself in the position that you talk about now where you look back and say, man, I really wish I would have done something else. But see, I'd back up from college. So what, yes, we see it in college, and I, again, I've been teaching long enough that I see it happening, but so much of it is happening prior to that. So again, high stakes testing, we moved to students reading passages instead of books. I mean, you know, I developed any kind of consciousness about class as an idea by reading Grapes of Wrath. I read that the 10th grade. Like, we read The Grapes of Wrath, not, not like a passage from The Grapes of Wrath, because that wouldn't work. You have to read the whole thing. You have to go on the journey with the family. I encountered my first black woman author in the 11th grade when we read Beloved, because we read the whole book because you have to. And so like, if, like if I could save the world, I'd say just read the whole book. I don't even care what book it is, but just read the whole thing and not passages for comprehension. If, God, books are hard and great. And then instead of us talking about ourselves, we're talking about the character. Well, what is Setha doing? What is, you know, what is John doing? What is, you know, if we're all reading To Kill a Mockingbird, what are, so it's not me, it's how does Scout feel? What is Scout, and, and all of a sudden you can back up just enough, because I think part of what happens, it's not just thoughts and feelings, it's soul. When you're in a conversation with someone who you think respects your fundamental humanity, you can breathe, you can be curious, you can listen, you can, that person can trip over a word or say something a little funny to your ear, it's a little tin, and it's okay, because you trust each other. But if you don't trust your teachers because they don't seem to see you as a human, if you don't trust your classmates because they don't seem to respect like your inner, I mean, soul is just the best word I can think of that's not your thoughts and feelings. Because I don't mean, oh, how do you feel? I just mean like, oh, wow, you're, you're fully human and interesting and sometimes really annoying and a mess and me too. And then that building of trust allows us to do it. A friend of mine, can I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, go for it. Um, I was in Hungary a year ago um, mm. this month and for the first time, and I was walking around Budapest with uh, a friend I'd only known through email, and uh, she's maybe th in her early 30s, and she was raised uh, at, without communism, and um, she was telling me that the hardest thing for her country to deal with now is to try to rebuild civil society. She said people have no trust for each other. 
because you couldn't trust your neighbor or even your own family in some cases because if you trusted the wrong person, you could, um, you could end up in jail. Mm -hmm. And she said that the, the survival skills that we Hungarians had to develop, my parents' generation, grandparents' generation, under communism have made it very, very hard for us mm -hmm. to thrive and to, and to put society back together. Now, hearing her say this sort of thing, made, and you just sparked this, this thought, what if you can't trust the people around you because you don't know who's got a smartphone out mm -hmm. recording what you say in an unguarded moment and it's going to blast it out on the internet and destroy mm -hmm. your life. Uh, mm -hmm. I got a call a few years ago from a man, a doctor in the U.S. whose mother is from um, Czech Republic. She spent six years in in, as a political prisoner in Czechoslovakia. And uh, she's very old, living with them now. She told him that she's starting to feel in this culture some of the same f fear she had from when she was a young woman in communist Czechoslovakia, and you had to watch everything you said. I thought she was maybe a little bit o overreacting, so I wrote to a friend of mine in the UK who he and his wife defected in the 60s uh, in protest of the Soviet invasion of their country, defected from Hungary. I said, this is what this, um, this Czech woman said. Is it true? Do you feel the same way? He said, absolutely. My wife and I are sitting here every day reading the paper in the UK and watching TV saying, this is like our youth. I have made a point since then, every time I meet somebody who grew up in the Soviet Union or in Eastern Europe, to ask them, or who live here now, ask them, are you seeing this too? All of them say absolutely. And it's coming down to the inability to trust anybody else because you don't know if they're going to be the ones who turn you in or record you, and, th and they say it's, you can't just be wrong now. They will try to destroy your life. So I think we are building, th this one Czech uh, engineer I know, he said we are building a system like that here in this country under capitalism, um, but it's, it's coming from social media, from the inability to trust anybody else, because our political system rewards destroying the other person. So, well, what, what if they also might not just have a phone? What if they may be armed? So I feel you, but then I also think about the danger that I just was having a conversation with a young person in Florida who was like, stand your ground terrifies me. I don't know at any point who might, because we're having an argument, take out a gun and shoot me. And again, across yeah. all these lines of difference and ideology, but also across race and class, so there's young people living in um, cities and in rural communities where they fear their peers, people who look like them, and then there's also differences where you fear authority, right? So we're also, we're armed with our smartphones and then we're also armed. Yeah. So, so we've got about three to five minutes left. And so I wanna ask you sort of one question that I always like asking folks like you because people sort of pigeonhole folks. And one of the things that we wanna to do tonight is to try to understand that there's a humanity on the other side of, of these views. And so I, I really, I should have put this in the email before to get you to think about this. So I'll just put you on the spot. Uh, either of you could start, but if you could give me, say, three to five books or things oh, we written, get to make the syllabus right written now. by people on the other side okay. that you've really enjoyed reading or think that have been really eye-opening, not in terms of they've mm -hmm. changed your mind on something, but they've really helped expose you to, say, the humanity on the other side. Which books or what things might you suggest to someone who says, look, I'm a, I'm a social conservative, but I really want to read something on the other side. Melissa, someone comes to you and says, look, I'm on the left, but you seem really thoughtful. What, what could I read on the other side to better understand where these individuals are coming from? What would, what would you suggest? Well, so I would start with Road to Serfdom, which I think is a crucial book, Hey Duck, H-A-Y-D-U-K. I'd start there. I, I taught that book a long time ago. I still love to teach that text. So um, Road to Serfdom is very much, a, in certain ways, about these questions of the loss of individualism. Um, I would say this is an, a book, but it's just a writer. I really do love Michael Brendan Donnery, who writes um, for the National Review online and is constantly weighing in on crucial and important um, topics in a very thoughtful <coughs> way, and I read Michael regularly. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I am married to a Catholic, and I don't know that I think of Catholicism as the other side, um, but, but I mean, I, it, I mean, it's Lent, um, but, but um, so, and, and I'm presumably raising a Catholic, although uh, very badly. Um, uh, but. But there's actually, um, I actually think it's really, for people who are church nerds, as, and I'm a little bit of one, historically, um, the encyclias are 
are powerful to read and to go back and just spend some time thinking about the development of church history. I also, like I said, I'm from a Latter-day Saints family, and so um, there are also um, the, the new revelations that occur um, that, are, that are also worth reading and understanding sort of how members of the Latter-day Saints community um, really think about um, how there's a continuing set of revelations that come um, in the 20th century to Americans. Um, and again, I'm definitely not Mormon, but I have great respect for the ways that that shapes what life and community um, <coughs> looks like. Uh, let me think of more, but those are, those are some off the top of my head. That's, uh, it's hard to come up with specific books. I mean, I think about when I was young, I, I read The Color Purple, and that really, uh, it was in high school then, and it really, um, to say it shocked me as to imply that there was some, it's not the right thing, but it, helped, it opened my eyes to a, a world that I just didn't know. Um, but more recently, I, I think of a writer I read a lot, Andrew Sullivan. Uh, he's a gay Catholic. Uh, he and I. Like, whose side is Andrew on? Well, that's just it. <laughs> Andrew and I are, 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 are frenemies. Yeah. You know, I. With I, everyone. I, I really, I'm, I'm so fond of him, but we're so much alike. Mm -hmm. You know, we were raised, he was raised in England, but he's got, gotten to be friends and I know about his life. But um, he is still a practicing Catholic, a very liberal Catholic. Uh, I'm an ex-Catholic. I lost my faith covering the scandal, but I'm still a very observant Christian, Eastern Orthodox Christian, and I'm very conservative on sec issues of sexual morality. Um, I love talking to Andrew and reading Andrew to keep uh, my eye on what it's like to be a gay Catholic and to I'll remind myself that he is a human being, a flesh and blood human being, and as, as angry as our arguments can be from time to time, he's a good man, and I really like him. And, uh, and he's given me a lot to think about. I also like reading some of the, the magazines on the new left, like Jacobin and mm -hmm. Plus One. Mm -hmm. Even when I completely disagree with what they have to say, they are really interesting, and they challenge me. And they're not just uh, the sort of you know, left-wing liberal Democratic Party consensus, but they're coming at it from a more radical point of view. And I find that I have, um, I, I agree with a lot of what they have to say about the way the economy, the structure of the economy shapes our, our morality and the way we relate. So um, for me, it, and it's kind of interesting to think about that. I don't even, mm -hmm. it's more writers and mm -hmm. magazines than it is particular books because yeah. things seem to be changing so, so fast, fast. <laughs> that um, I remember, you might remember a thousand years ago when Beto O'Rourke was the latest uh, <laughs> flavor of the day on the Democratic Party. <laughs> He's now, back today. He's but, back. But, but doesn't he seem like so 10,000 years ago? Yeah. And he just announced the president today, if I you know. haven't heard. But um, so I like to try to follow different I'll writers. I'll be announcing next week because clearly <laughs> we're just all in. No, of course not. Yeah. I'm just saying like uh, uh, we, everybody's in for president. Are we going to have time, Chris, just to, a couple of minutes to get Melissa's views uh, on 2020? You guys want this, the Melissa views on 2020? Yeah. The people get what they want. Oh my God. This is <laughs> yeah, because we're, we're all about the consumer experience. <laughs> the That's consumer right. experience. Here, and well, so I just, I, so I, I, I just want to say, so I, I appreciate when you talk about the magazines because um, Matt Welch and Reason is someone I also read a lot. Um, but also on the, on the gay Catholic thing, boy, do I have a book for you. Um, my friend Michael Arsenault, who is black and gay and Catholic and from the South, just wrote a book called I Can't Date Jesus, and it's a memoir. And you want to talk about <laughs> shocked. I would enjoy having a book club with you about I Can't Date Jesus. Okay. Um, so, look, I, I am not, I don't have predictive capacity. I'm just sort of irritated by the 2020. Um, I guess what I would say is this. Um, my complaint in 2016 was that no Democrat ran for president, which seemed odd for me. Um, obviously, <laughs> Bernie ran. He was not a Democrat. Is not a Democrat. But it was clearly a, a, a cabal, a choice, to allow only Hillary Clinton to run um, for that seat. Because after two terms, of, uh, two, I think, arguably quite successful terms, right? In other words, one could have made an argument that it had been a success, right? One could also make an argument that it was a failure, but from the Democratic side, you could certainly argue that it was a success. You had a two-term president, and not even his vice president ran, right? So no one, no one looked at the White House and was like, yeah, let's do that. They were like, nah, never mind. So that's, of course, not what happened, right? There was a choice for everyone to not run. And what I've always said is that the only chance that Hillary ever had of winning is if there had been a real primary, because she needed to register voters, get people, like that's how Democrats win. Democrats win when voters get registered in a long, bruising primary all across the country. It's how Obama won. 
So we're going to get that. We're going to get a long, bruising primary. And that will be, in the long term, I suspect, good for the Democrats. Because people will register, and it will go for a long time. But I think the challenge for me, as I'm looking at this field, is it seems that very little has been learned over the course of the past decade <coughs> about what Americans really want in a candidate. And with the DNC going to Milwaukee, it also seems that they are, they've bought a particular narrative about who they need to um, convince to vote for them. And because President Trump has been created as the evil boogeyman on the right who encompasses all bad things, racism, sexism, um, anti-immigrant um, ideology, every bad and awful thing, and therefore is antithetical to all things Democrat. Never mind that President Obama was deporting people until the last day of his presidency. He just was. He just was. He was separating families at the border. He just was. I mean, President Obama separated, not him personally, but his you know, his Department of Homeland Security did that. And so what's going to happen, I suspect, is that, you know, Democrats are also racist and sexist, like Harvey Weinstein is not a Republican donor. So all the things that we said that makes Trump unacceptable to be president, well, guess what? That is an American problem. Anti-black racism is a thing Americans have, like as a real nasty, ugly disease. Patriarchy and sexism, a thing American voters have. Like our discomfort with women, our potential anxieties and histories. I mean, I think, <laughs> I think the main reason Biden hasn't put his hat in yet is because he still doesn't know what the fuck to do about his Anita Hill problem. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. He literally is like, oh shit, that Anita Hill thing is really a mess now because of um, Kavanaugh. Like, he was fine until Kavanaugh, and then he was like, oh shit, Anita Hill, oh no, what? Because, yeah, guess what? Racism, sexism is a democratic thing too. And so if we could have been more honest about that and be like, no, we don't like Trump because of these things, as opposed to like going to the emotional space that he is unfit to be president because he's racist, as though there haven't been lots of racist American presidents, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> or sexist, like there haven't been a lot of sexist presidents, Bill Clinton, <laughs> right? Then, like, we just, we're in this weird spiral where it's gonna be, re and so there's like maybe one or two who aren't like Kamala Harris, but she's like paint drying. But she's what? She's like paint drying, that was the. <laughs> oh. She, she also, criminal justice issues, perhaps not. Uh, well, but uh, you don't know about them because you're. Fair enough. <laughs> well, I, I, very Ron, drowsy. Ron, 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 I'm going to give you the last word. Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief. On, on the Republican <laughs> side, of course, we're, we're going to have Trump. Um, and I think what's, whether he's going to win or lose is going to depend on who the Democrats nominate because people like me who don't like Trump, didn't vote for him in 2016, think he's not been a good president, but I'm not afraid of Trump. I mean, Trump, I, I, I can understand why some people are, but he doesn't come after people like me. The um, religious liberty. Look, it's fair. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, no. The blacks in the back are like, well, yeah. Well, I know, I know. Well, but but here's what I, <laughs> I love the here's what I'm saying though. Religious <laughs> liberty is my big issue, and I think the Democrats right. are terrible on this. If I have to mm. fear that the Democrats are, are going to come after uh, by uh, uh, using the IRS or anything like that, my Christian school, my church, things like that that is going to inspire people like me who don't like Trump to vote defensively for him. And I think the de problem the Democrats have is if they have to, in their primary, to distinguish themselves and become more woke than the other one, then that's gonna make it, uh, the, whoever they end up with might scare so many middle of the road people, the people who are Obama voters who voted for Trump, um, they might be scared back to vote for Trump um, simply because he's the devil we know. Well, and look, I just figure, and this is my political consulting hat rather than my political science hat, guess that people are going to vote for the candidate of their party, right? So just go, ahead and, just go ahead and predict that. People will vote for the candidate of their party. And then there's a group of people who are unaffiliated, 
But the big question consistently is how excited are folks to get out to vote? And so President Obama wins in both 2008 and in 2012 for one week reason, because African-American women vote at a rate seen only in countries where it is illegal not to vote. I'm gonna say that one more time. In 2008 and in 2012, African-American women voted at a rate that we see only, the turnout rate, in countries where it is mandatory to vote. So it was as though it were illegal not to vote for Michelle's husband. <laughs> and I say that because it's not about the percentages, all those weird things that happen around like, oh, white women, no. People vote for the candidate of their party, but turnout and that excitement and that enthusiasm, particularly the willingness to get up over the barriers of voter ID, of the, because remember, this is also, 2016 was the first election without the protections of the Voting Rights Act in 50 years. But notice how no Democratic candidate said that. So there were 26, there were 26 televised debates between the two parties, primaries and the generals. Not one candidate and not one reporter asked, so hey, for the past 50 years we've had this law called the Voting Rights Act and now not so much. How do you think that might impact the election? And so with no clear awareness of that and with no enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton, black women voted at the same um, like split for her, but the numbers were way depressed. And so for me, yeah, it's about those swing voters, but it's really because it is always about us. And so if you can get somebody that black women truly in our core soul are down for, we might win. This and Beto O'Rourke, it ain't. <laughs> I mean, unless he's doing something I don't know about. He might be, I mean, and Cory Booker. On that note, this has been great. Thank Not you both. Her. Please join me in thanking Thank Rod Brewer and Melissa Harris. <laughs> 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 <laughs>